Welcome to the Best Team Wins podcast with Adam Robinson. He's talking to today's industry leaders and entrepreneurs about the people side of their business. Welcome to the Best Team Wins podcast, where we feature entrepreneurs and business leaders whose exceptional approach to the people side of their business has led to incredible results. My name is Adam Robinson, and this week we're changing things up a bit. My team at Hireology recently hosted Elevate, the only retail automotive summit dedicated to human capital management. And following Elevate, I wanted to share a recording from one of the featured sessions at the event. Continue listening here to hear from Sherry Schultz, Chief Human Resources Officer at Minneapolis-based Walzer Automotive Group, as she discusses the future of dealership human capital management. I'm so uh, grateful to be here. It's such a pleasure to meet some new friends in the, in the industry, but also have a chance to talk about what I love. And I, I have to say, I love my job. Um, and I think if, if you can find that in your soul every day, then we're all doing the right thing, right? Because you, uh, you, there's a saying that I, I say that you have to be uh, happy to be successful or successful to be happy. I always choose happy to be successful. And so I've kind of led my life that way with some amazing experiences and met some really good people. So I I want to start just with a little bit of a a slide on on HR. And, you know, I think um, for me, it's been simple. Um, And I I try to to drill things down to the things that make the most sense. Uh, From an HR perspective, um, we have got to know this business, right? And so the, the most important compelling side of what we do isn't the HR hygiene that we provide. You pay us and you expect us to staff and hire and fire and payroll and that, that's hygiene, that's the price of entry. Um, I, I think it's great when we do that well and it should be systematically done well, but that's not what gets us up out of bed, right? It's to drive your businesses and to uh, innovate and to drive success in your terms. So when I first came to Walzer, and I've been there about six months now, the first thing that I did was nothing but learn this business and study and study and study and study the business, the P&L. And I teach financial literacy and um, the P&L to my team, and I hold us accountable to a very high standard of, of our automotive retail math. And I think that is a, it's a game changer and has been in the experiences that I've had, um, and that was uh, core to, I think, a couple of the different models that I worked in. So um, again, basic hygiene, we do what you'd expect us to do, but accelerated HR means that you know this business. Right, and so I'm incredibly excited about the uh, HR 20 group because I'd love to see us invest in, in um, automotive financial literacy and exactly ensure that the HR team can rip apart PBR and units and understands the reserve and can speak to all of the elements of F&I the way our counterparts. We can only add value to a GM if we speak in their terms. So therein lies that we drive performance through knowing the business. And then in the end, um, if we don't advocate for people, Right? Without credibility, it's really hard for me to come in and say, hey, I might want to do it a different way, or you know, have we thought about this? If I don't understand your business, I'm not attuned to what's going on in your world. What right do I have to come in and say I can fix it? So I think when you think about um, the, the wiring of an HR team, our dealers made an investment in the HR function. So I'll start with saying that that's an important thing to understand. So we, we are, um, but it's not an investment that couldn't be taken away if we didn't drive value and we didn't drive performance of the business. So therein lies the P&L and teaching that information. So imagine a world where we have more qualified candidates and we know what to do with. They're swimming around. They're everywhere, you just you have your pick. Um, these candidates are accessible quickly. With, within days, they can become part of our teams. Not 26 days, not 17 days, days they can become part of your team. Um, they're a perfect fit for us. So for, for Don Johnson Group, who I've read some of your sites and the Fox Group, some, some wonderful things differentiate you from other dealerships. In my neck of the woods, Morris or Luther's, or, you know, we all have different brands. Our candidates are handpicked for us. It is a perfect fit. And then, oh, imagine if we could also sell a car to all these people. Because I do believe that candidates are customers and customers are candidates as well. So um, dream a reality. What is it? Why not? And I can give you some examples in my career where we actually, uh, we happened upon some significant cash through our candidate pace. So I'll talk about it a little bit. So if we want a different result, we have to do things differently, right? It's a possibility. It's not there today, but we have to look at why it isn't. And if you want something different, let's suggest we're trying a bunch of things that may or may not be working, um, that are or not situationally successful techs versus CSs or salespeople versus uh, fixed ops. I mean, I'd pay a million dollars to get the right team on fixed ops in our organization, no question. 
You know, so if we want a different result, we have to do things differently. And my, my husband appreciated that I didn't give the insanity line here, but in the end, it ain't working. So we gotta figure out what is gonna work. So I'm gonna give you a little bit of a, this is a, a courtesy of my 20 year old, right? So a few other sectors in the world have figured it out. The more social you are, the better your chances are at finding happiness, right? So there are some corollaries that suggest people spend a tremendous amount of time in a social environment. Would you agree? Who's checking Facebook right now? Come on, I know. Right, there's some out there. So social networking, 3.2 billion active users, Facebook leads the way, right? 3.2 billion active users, and it's, for, and it's by choice. It's not a requirement, it's not for your health, you don't have to do it like your taxes. People choose to do this every day, a, a, at a low side six times a day, at a high side 20 times a day. I think my kid does it six times before she's even out of bed, right? So uh, in the end, that's, you, you, we can't deny it. So, so I'm not gonna use the word millennials, I'm not gonna talk about, this is our reality. This is the norm, right? And uh, again, against all ages, and I'll, I'll get to that. And then this, I, I do this because I think, um, I think online dating is a proxy for recruitment in a lot of ways. You can make a, a, if you can clearly connect and find love in the world, you can absolutely find a job, no? I mean, let, let's, it's, it's, uh, it's a fact of life today, um, and in the end, 21 million, or about 15% of the adult Americans today are using online dating sites and or mobile apps, and I think people are lying. I think it's higher, right? But this is, this is of internet usage, and then of that population, 50% of those people know somebody who's doing it as well, right? So it's, it's pretty big. And I talk about it because it is the way that people are connecting, right? So a couple of different slides, and so I think um, I'll give you some data on this the notion of love being blind, or is it, right? People began putting their profiles out there in the world a very long time ago, right? This isn't new news, and in the 60s, uh, two undergrads, and this is not the Facebook story, it's somewhat similar, um, began Operation Match, where they had 8,000, and it was paper at the time, but an algorithm uh, that ran a match for its students to fraternity members. Interesting, right? It's hot back then, Harvard guys did it. Um, in the 70s, we were all about the classifieds, right? The Pina Colada song, anybody remember it in the room? Right, somewhat similar. And then in the 80s and the 90s, it was all about video dating, right? You could send in your, your video profile and people could say, wow, that's a good one, right? So not a new thing. Today, online dating spans a generation. So we had a lot of conversations yesterday about, you know, uh, are we knocking out the 50 and up crowd relative to experience? Clearly we're not, right? Because 38% of the population is dating online in our you know, in their late 40s, 50s, right? So you, you've got a sense there that this is not a millennial thing. Now, it is in that 40% of today's youth meet people online as part of a social connection. And in the end, the dating pool is 52% men and 48% women, not unlike our population available for, for jobs. Um, you know, so a, a couple of other components on it. Big, big social affirmation. 20% of people forward a date and say, what do you think of him or her? Looking for validation, same thing with your job, same thing with, hey, I heard about this company. What's it like to work for Fox? Would I do that? Should I do that? Do you know anyone? Um, online dating surveys suggest that the best sites are fun. And this is, I think, when, when we talked to Adam uh, yesterday and he used a wonderfully long, rolling job description that showed exactly how fun it would be to apply to our stuff. People don't do it, right? They, they, they're not gonna do it if it's not fun, and in the end, the way that people are, are looking at fun also combines where are you, right? So connection, I see you in GPS, you're on the street. Those of you who have seen the match ads, you know they're using geofencing and, and GPS data to say, huh, this potential, uh, potential match is actually in my neighborhood right now. So 59% of people will prefer meeting people online just to get acquainted. So casual relationships, not just marriage, casual, 43% use online tools uh, in that way, 66% exchange basic information to almost very personal and use it as an ongoing way to date, right? So the concept of social networking is critical. Um, I, I raise this because I would tell you, um, we've talked a lot about women in the organization and I think it's a platform based on uh, title holders and the expectation that 51% of our title holders are female and 80% of the time they're a couple and a decision maker. So why wouldn't we have them in our workforce? We gotta do it. In addition, diversity recruitment. 
as a part of it, and that's a whole, Adam and I could spend an, several hours talking about that, but you know, the notion of GLBT and minority participation in matches, it's also equally as compelling to remove biases and do that online from a job perspective. Uh, GLBT and, and minority um, dating sites are incredibly uh, proliferate and a really great way to meet, meet people. Um, just a note there, Sundays are the most popular times, 7 p.m., same, same for recruitment actually. Right? We don't work those days usually as we're looking at candidates, but many folks are looking off hours, so keep that in mind as well. And then here's the funny part, Tinder, Match, and OkCupid, all same company, by the way. So they've decided this is an industry that they're gonna own, just like who? We're an industry. Why are we treating our recruitment any differently? So I, I'll, 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 I'll take you on the leap in a minute. So today also more than 35% of newlyweds met online. Here's, that's the clincher, that's the hire, right? So it is a source, people are doing it online, and if you can find love, right, online, then you should be able to find your second love, a job. My husband says that's my first love, and he's my second, but I swear he's my first. So a phrase we use at work um, quite a bit, um, word of mouth is fast replacing word of mouth. Right? And so it's an interesting way to think about the way we connect. And, and what I'm painting here for you all is a picture that, that posting and praying, the use of Indeed, the ongoing spend is a one-shot deal. The relationships that people like to build are social and happen over time, all the time, at any time. And so are we thinking that way about the, the work that we're doing? So what does this mean for dealers, our industry, human capital, and recruitment? So, Let's get some myths here. And I think everybody and all my amazing counterparts in the audience heard things like this today and we've covered some of them today. Um, candidates look for jobs when they need them. Um, if a candidate wants to work for us, they will take the time to apply. And we own our candidates. If they apply to our dealership, they must want to work with us, right? So candidates look for jobs when they need them. False, actually, right? Adam referenced this earlier. 73% of all candidates are passive. All right? 40% of the people that sit in our very desks today sit with us right alongside of us, say, yeah, I'm looking. Looking because they're interested, looking because they're unhappy, doesn't matter, they're looking. And so um, able to be influenced, right? Make sense? And then last, 89% of candidates look at opportunities on their mobile devices, and, th and that's real. And so thus the, the push towards opt-in text opportunities and our ability to do things fast. We are a, a population of, of no patience. I am, I am one of those as well, but you would imagine that we would be foolish to leave social connectivity and text and mobile applications on the table as, eh, maybe we should, maybe we shouldn't, if we can see things like this, right? And so remembering such, this is a choice that people so choose to do it, and if they're choosing to do it for fun, you know, how could we use that choice and do it in a way that allows us to hire great people. So 3.2 people engage in social networking for the purposes of staying connected, maintaining, and making friendships, and social validation. So the notion of likes, right? I like this job, I like this company. You know, I'm, I, I absolutely love to give my feedback on our sites, and I like to ensure that folks are feeling connected to what we're doing, because they're looking. I mean, they're looking. So it's an important way to think about it. If a candidate wants to work for us, they will take the time to apply. So we saw that long rolling piece, and in the end, I'd say partially true, eventually, uh, maybe. All right, so we talk about candidate fatigue, we talk about the turnoff, we talk about the length of time. What do they do? So they do at least five or six steps and they ask and check with 16 on average other resources, and I've used a, a million different data sources to scrub on this relative to social data. But they will look at your company website, they will reference any experience they've had with you. So, have they bought a car historically? Has a family member bought a car historically? Has a friend bought a car from us historically? So those things are very, very important. And we actually have a program um, that Ryan loves when we hand out, but we have cards that when we, when we see it, we know it. I met a guy in Office Max buying a new commuter, computer the other day, by the end of it, he's interviewing. All right, I got my card, come, see, come, come on, come see me. Because he demonstrated something and he said, really, let me go check right in front of me, let me check the site. Goes right on, this, on Instagram, and he's looking exactly in my face. And I'm going, God, I hope something's good right now. <laughs> I'm looking at it saying, okay, real-time recruiting happening on the fly with me right in Office Max. So he's going to check with their network. He said, yeah, you know what? My brother-in-law just bought a car there. And the rest is history. Because you not only want candidates to feel good about the experience that they've had. We are a retailer. You want them to say, hey, I could be part of that. Right? And, and so there's that connectivity associated with customers and candidates. Um, and then in the end, 
They scan the social media sites. They look at Google, Google reviews relative to the business. Uh, Adam referenced Glassdoor. They do the same. Right? Um, if an application process is too long, they will fatigue and drop out. So we've talked about this in our advisory session yesterday. For every question over the top 10 questions that need to be asked, 35% say, I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it. Too tired, too long, too tired, too tired, too tired. Um, and then talent networks work best, right? So we call it lead capture. It's no different as, as we think about our own lead capture in, in, in driving customers to our stores. It is no different. So creating connectivity, uh, a communication platform, a social networking community for people who are interested in automotive retail. So imagine that, because we're going to pose something crazy. 85% of all passive candidates will join a talent network or a community if presented with an option to join before applying. So dating versus marriage, right? One step click into a talent network, I don't have to get hired by you. I don't have to do the app yet, but I'm going to enter the threshold of your organization and hang out with you. So, right? I mean, I eat Tinder. Yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe not, maybe left, but I'm in there, and I'm visible, and I'm hanging out. And so that, is, that notion of social hanging out is a critical way for us to think about it. And it's a very cool way to actually connect with people and to... Uh, get to know them and them to know us. Um, and they have said, I will do this because they opted in. So you meet all sorts of, where's Wendy? Some compliance rules are, are met by these things because they're opting in to do it. So, so talent networks, from a recruitment perspective, um, there are some industries that do it well. So I'll come back to that in a second. So in the end, we own our candidates. And this is the thing, when I look at the group and I recognize where we came from, right, it's competitive. Sometimes we don't even want to share with our own dealerships. Come on, it's true. All right, I'm not transferring my Toyota to my Honda guy. I'm not gonna give you from, I'm not taking Subaru and putting, I'm not doing it. I am paid to win in my store, or are we? Right? So in the end, most qualified candidates who are ready to make a move are entertaining multiple offers. All right? our, our unemployment rights are incredibly low. Sub, sub four for, for anywhere in Minneapolis, for us we're in the twos, so it's, a, it's an absolute nightmare. Um, and you know, it's the lowest it's been in, in some time. Um, in 19, there's a lot of writing right now based on uh, what we heard from, from Billy Bean today. Predictive indicators, artificial intelligence assessments, are they going to be used to predict the performance on a job and actually help the, if you will, e-carmony, as I'm calling it. So it's not e-harmony, but I am, gosh, this is the right profile for me. You are the right match for me. That will happen. I've done some work on that before. There are opportunities to legally validate that type of work. Um, which means that it's actually necessity and it's present in the work that we're doing. So we don't want to just screen for it if we don't need it. So there are processes that companies use to really help narrow the focus. And it is wildly successful when it's done. Um, but in the end, candidates are applying outside of the industry and dealers are recruiting outside of the industry. Right? The question around, around whether whatever your model is, you're an experienced location, you're looking to uh, build and develop and or we at Walzer, we don't, we don't look for experience. We actually look for something very different, which is none. We look for a retail um, interest. We look for the right connectivity, empathy. We drive a different, uh, we are a one price dealership as well. And so um, our approach is uh, one person. So we take the F&I and desking process. We do the menu, everything with one person. So it is a career. It is an investment in growth and opportunity. Um, and for us, it, it, we'd actually, we prefer no experience. Right? Because there is a, a learning curve and a growth pattern that happens in one price that is harder once you've negotiated to go to a one price mentality. So um, I think it's, it's a, the notion of if we open up the gates to other places, right? and, and by the way, Carvana and others are doing that for us anyway. Right? They're removing a good deal of, of our ability to do it and transact that way. So how about we find cool people to sell our vehicles? So you know, is there a way to think about it a little bit differently? Um, and then in the end, it's, it's, uh, I'll, I'll add the fourth bullet. It's harder to compete, right? I think we, we, we talked about it in one of the sessions today. We kind of have a bad rap, right? So there is a perceived, uh, per, uh, perceived issue with selling cars, right? It is it the type of career you want? Are you going to run home and tell your, your mom or your dad that you graduated college and you're going to go sell cars? And I talk to kids all the time that say this. So we have a rap of being a bit of a, a slick crew, uh, we enjoy negotiating, you know, not trustworthy. And so that J.D. Powers reference that was made early, you know, I think it puts uh, car sales at the bottom 5 to 6% of all careers. Fireman number one, nurse number two, somewhere in that. Um, perfect stranger, 45%. So I'd rather meet a perfect stranger off the street than connect with a car salesperson. <laughs> 
my poor dad, right? So I, I, I think in the end, um, thinking that we own our candidates when we've got all this headwind, we don't. They will find something fun to do, right? They will find someone cool to work for, and they have choice, right? So there, there's, there's no question. The only thing we own is our own reputation, the employment brand we offer, and the candidate experience. What does it feel like? And if you would take the, the online dating as a cue, they want to come in and, and get to know you. Are we giving them an option to do that? And so part of my, my roadmap and the, the, the investment that Hierology and I have made in thinking about things for Walzer is, you know, what would we do if we had the ability to create a, a talent community? How would it look? As dealers, we wouldn't want to invest in clarifying our unique employment brands and, and getting to know our candidates. Why wouldn't we invest in that time to go do that? So would we rather lose candidates to outsider industry or lose them to each other? So here's where I'm going with this. Okay. I did a case study, actually it wasn't a case study, it's a case study for, for purposes of this, but I, w I worked for Sears for many years, and um, I'll give you some background on the business. And Sears, you know, we filled 185,000 jobs a year, um, so it was a significant hiring um, organization. We have 3,000 locations. So the business and employment brand has struggled for some time, um, but it's part of a strategy to roll out of, of brick and mortar and into digital. Um, so. 3,000 locations, a lot of jobs, we were spending a ridiculous amount of money on Career Builder. Um, but we had a lot of candidates in our pipeline, but we couldn't interact with them. Um, so we had to keep respending to post, respending to post, respending to post, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars to spend on, on recruitment advertising. Yet we were capturing people, but we didn't know how to communicate with them. The CRM wasn't a thing yet. Seasonal hiring was about 35,000, and we had a very short period of time to do it two times in the year, Father's Day and Christmas. 35, can you imagine that? 35,000 up, 35,000 down, seasonal hiring. It was, a, it was hardcore. Um, and then, in the end, a very short period of time to do it. How are you gonna do that? How are you gonna get 35,000 people to join you in 3,000 locations? It was, it was a tricky thing. So we ended up building a talent community, somewhat similar to you know, match.com. We talk about a talent community, and we talked about this uh, with Hierology yesterday in our advisory committee. And in the end, it's a single click apply. Yes, I want to be part of your talent community. Um, when we did that, we filled our jobs very quickly because people were real time. And they were linked in through Facebook so that people update Facebook more than they update anything else in the world. You get new boyfriend, married, moves to, it's current. People are constantly updating their social profiles. At the same time, we had a loyalty program that we injected $5 of points with into the candidate that joined the talent community. There was an investment there. When they became an applicant, we put that five bucks in. Guess what happened? They turned around and they bought hammers and tools and, a million, and we made $12 million off our career website. I, 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 like, I have to say, like, I thought it was gonna be good, but I, I did kind of go like, yeah, that, yeah, we meant to do that. Right. Who knew that that was gonna happen? $12 million later, it is, a sing, it is as big as some stores Right? It's generating that kind of revenue because it links right to the website. So there was a selling component to it as well. Um, there was a networking component to it as well. And it created revenue. So uh, you know, candidates and, and applicants uh, spent money as well. So phase two, um, and here's where the provocative piece came. We, we positioned ourselves with another hiring partner to share networks. Right? So I had millions of candidates in this year's CRM database. I partnered with other retailers, right? So we created a retail talent network, retail talent community, and we shared. So stick with me. Don't go, oh, no, no, I'm going to geofence my people because we've already learned they don't, they're not loyal to us, even when they work with us, right? They're still looking around. So candidates appreciated the ease of the process, right? Initially, my counterpart said, you're crazy, Sherry, we're not doing this. There are candidates, or we own them, and we didn't. That wasn't the case. So we merged shared talent communities. So if Fox and I, you have 10,000 candidates and yours, I have 10,000, we merge them, and there's 20,000 people now in there. I'm not spending on Indeed. I got 20,000 people to go pick from, unless I want to target my communication spend, which I did at Sears, to military. 9,000 veteran hires. I spent on what I wanted to spend, not what I needed to spend. So because we shared candidates, we became a household name relative to the sector associated with durable goods, appliances, Lowe's, Home Depot. We, we were in, and we, 
we protected the, the, retail, autom the retail space. And so we, um, cost came down, company spend was more strategic on, on all fronts, and in the end, we became our own you know, employment opportunity inside that. So what if all right, dealer A, B, and C had an amazing career website, and you developed your own value proposition, right? So I'm on Don Johnson's site, I see ladies first, right? I look at exactly what I, I, that speaks to me, you know? So I look at it and I think, okay, we do share a similar value proposition. However, there may be others that don't. I am non-negotiating. Others may be, you know, so you have your value proposition. Would you rather trade candidates to the outside world or keep them inside for us? So the questions around each de uh, dealer developing their own career website with their own employment value proposition, and then we work with Hireology on a talent network, and we share. Right? We share candidates, and in the end, um, we reduce our spend in, in outside uh, resources. We develop uh, a brand, and we think provocatively about how do we give ourselves a facelift? Right? How do we approach the next generation by being an automotive talent network where the individual can learn exactly what is the benefit to joining one of our fine companies? We pay more than Deloitte right now. Come on, they're paying 50 grand out of the gates. We pay more to our salespeople, way more. Why would we not do this? And so it's a provoking question, and I've had a lot of folks say, I won't even share them with my own dealerships. Why would I share them with anybody else? That may be true. My question is, if you believe in yourself, your own employment brand, and you recognize there are differences between us, why wouldn't we leverage the reputation that we have and rebrand as an industry and create a lot more discussion around why go automotive versus go work for Target? Because that's what I'm competing with in my, in my hood. So, fireside time? It's time. All right. All right. So, a conversation we've had previously that you've expounded upon here, the notion that candidates are mine. I'm not going to share, even within my group. Yesterday's meeting, we're talking about uh, general managers refusing to promote or to allow the release of top performers to other stores where there's a greater opportunity because they're incentivized to drive performance at their store. They're not incentivized to drive performance of the group. That's a reality everyone here is dealing with. What's your answer for that? It's a, it's a big question. It's about aligning incentives. How, how can I create a world for my owners in which it's worth it to me to let my best go be better in another store because it's good for the organization. It was an interesting discussion that we had, and so we are shifting uh, for 19, our incentives for GMs, 75% their store, 25% Minnesota. So the total performance of the team, you know, there is an expectation that the exportation of talent is part of the winning. We can't grow, and we learned it painfully when we, when we bought Wichita because right, we didn't have enough talent to go down there. And we need that. And you know, so part of the growth strategy for us, and that uh, the walls are way, can be translated very clearly if we're moving from you know, a new point coming on Subaru, a new point, you know, we, we need to be able to, to grow it from within. So it was a business need for us. I would, I would ask the business need question versus this is how we've done it and we've paid this way because my GM owns their P&L and this is what they get paid on. Is that the right way? And it's, I, it's an honest question for me. So pay, pay for what you want. Um, if, yeah. if I am an HR leader here looking to better partner with, with my business partners in the stores, with my general manager uh, and, and leadership team, what can I as an HR leader bring to the, to the table, literally, to the, to the conversation that helps them be successful and that proves the value of the investment that the group's making in human capital leadership. Is, is it scary, foreign, never work, can't hear it? I mean, feedback, ideas. I mean, I think from an advisory committee, we met yesterday and we talked a lot about the fact that um, we're losing people to unhappiness. I had an exit interview recently where they said I felt, God, I felt hostage to a particular store. You know, I'd, I'd suggest that 
you know, some of us do have these scenarios where moving between stores is a challenge. In the end, I don't need 7,700 candidates in my pipeline right now. I don't. I need 700. But let's suggest, and we know this, I have people with family in Florida, right? They want to see their aging parents. This is real. But they don't know how to get there. Who's a Florida dealer in here? Okay. So I would love nothing more than to be able to say, I got Florida, I mean, the notion is we got to save the best for us inside here. Is there an angle to that? Because we, you know, we're, we're a powerful network if we think about ourselves in that way. And you know what? I think, I, I'm, I'm thinking less about the, they leave me for you, but I often find them looking for other places. Hey, do you guys have something in it? Or you can get a sense that somebody who wants to make a geographic change, and if you go back to my dating example, zip code is important, they don't know how to penetrate uh, or what, what are our opportunities in, in other areas because we don't, we don't look in that way. You know? So it wouldn't necessarily mean, I think if you were to put a bunch of folks in a particular pipeline and true to match.com, say, who's the best fit for me? L let us all compete that out, right? What you guys do is different than what, than what we do or what you know, Lithia does. Or, though, that's cool, but I'd rather keep them in, I'd rather lose them to one of you than, than losing to Target. And I know I have some ex-Target people in here. I love you guys. Right there. <laughs> we talked to the advisory board dinner yep. last night uh, about a matrix. And the word matrix has a connotation of complexity, but as, as you described it to us, it's, it's really not. You've got a couple of axes and, and, a, and a bell curve and a progression. Can you, I thought that's hugely valuable for this audience to hear the tactics of how you define performance and relate it to how much you make so people know what they're gonna make. Could you just give us a couple of minutes on that? Yeah, I mean, I think, so we do two things that I think are really important because we've, we, we want this movement. So first thing we do is succession planning, and I don't know if anybody um, has done this here or is doing it now, I'm sure some of you are, but we look at the, the, the axis on the, the bottom is performance, how are they doing in position, whether it's a CS right up to a GM, and it's whatever the metric may be, right? It could be, it could be net, it could be gross, it could be PVR, it could be units, whatever we're doing. And then the potential is, how high is high? Will they move, will they go, do they wanna go? And we look at a, a five part pie that has service, fixed ops is our weakness, without a doubt. Inventory, so new and used. General, CSI above what our OEM's requirements are clearly. And then we have a, an expectation around the walls or way as well, which is one price, and are they working the whole process right through to the release statement. And then people leadership, and financial literacy. So we look at all those things and we think, God, if we invested in this person, how high would high be? So we do that first and foremost. You know, the other thing that we do is we try to engage and keep people in the game on car one. So we created a, a, a comp grid that has uh, PVR one side, units the other side, and the PVR takes into consideration attachment and margin. So whether it's an environmental, whether it's an extended warranty, whether it's an accessory, everything is weighted and we know the frequency by which all of those things impact gross. We have a grid, so you sell eight cars at a 950 PVR, not so good. You sell 14 cars at a 1200, way better. So we're, we're helping them get there. And so our leaders are paid exclusively on the number of people in the bullseye. How are, I want you all to get money. I want people to have a good life. And so we help it, and it allows us um, with, from a recruitment perspective, but also from a training perspective for us to say, in the zone, we gotta get in the zone. How many are in the zone, how many are out of the zone? So that's our model, and it helps people think very clearly about how to be successful. And it's the same whether you're in Honda, Toyota, Hyundai, and you know, we have the, the privilege of a lot of great points. So that's. Yeah, I mean, and I, just to think of the power of understanding, you know, my, my question about what do, you, what do you bring to the table? So here we have the, the store, store leadership looking at the same grid, this much at this PVR, that's the zone. My job is to get people in the zone. Your job is to help them get people in the zone. We're looking at the same piece of paper. Everyone knows what the number is. Everyone knows what they make when those numbers are hit at any point on that continuum. Sounds simple. It's certainly not easy to get there. So what, what did it take to get that agreement on that as a way of doing business 
on the people side? I mean, I think from a, an HR perspective, if you go back to the heart on my grid, I, got, I have to advocate for people. So it is, I looked at exactly what they made last year and how they got there. I looked at where our units were off and you know, we backed into what we need. And in the end, it's a staffing question. Because if you know, we want 20 cars a month and I've got too many people on the floor, it's going gonna, it's gonna to trit out. You're going to figure out a way to right size it. So we went back and then we looked at you know, what are the products that um, we have high margin on, our reserve is important, and we went after it and said, okay, um, this is going to be the relationship between that. It was very time consuming, and it was not easy between CDK and dealer socket and all of our systems of record to figure it all out. Um, but, but we did, and I think it'll stand the test of time. And, you know, and we can move the target. Let's hope we can. Right? Let's hope we, we move the target. And it really allowed us to keep everybody engaged. Um, we had a, an odd PBR look back for a period of time that was very demotivating to salespeople. But you know, when, I, when I think about innovation, first you have to have a strong employment brand. Right? You have to, I, I mean, I, I, I would respect so much where all of you sit in your, in your own dealerships and the things that we're all good at are different. Right? We all come to the table with differences, as does Target or Best Buy or you know, Loft or Nordstrom, Trunk Club, got it? See, let's put it in there, Trunk Club. Um, the, our, the value propositions are all different. So I, I'm not afraid to compete relative to all of you. We're all different. I, I would love to get more people to stay in our industry. I'd love to rebrand. I'd love to lock out a lot of people that are going to you know, take talent away from us. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, Sherry Schultz. Thank you. And that's the final word. You've been learning from Sherry Schultz, CHRO at Walzer Automotive Group. Thank you, Sherry, for your great presentation at Elevate 2018. Thanks for tuning in. We will see you here next week. Thanks for listening to the Best Team Wins podcast with Adam Robinson. You can find out more information about Adam and his book, The Best Team Wins, Building Your Business Through Predictive Hiring at thebestteamwins.com. Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you next week.